Thanks for sharing that, Bobby. <clears throat> um, I feel that what I had to share is related. I wanted to, speaking of um, being a lover of self, I want to talk about self-centered praying versus God-centered praying. And um, I saw something in the Old Testament this week which challenged me to ask myself, how do I pray? Uh, but it's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 19. <clears throat> this is when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is uh, coming out against Hezekiah. And then in verse, uh, in, in chapter 19, Hezekiah comes to God. And in verse 14, it says, He takes the letter that Sennacherib had um, sent, and he went up to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord, and he prayed. And a part of the prayer that I wanted to focus on is in verse 19. He says, Now, O Lord our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are, O Lord, our God. And um, I thought it was interesting that he, he ends his prayer by saying, why do we want to be delivered? We want to be delivered so that people will know you are God. And uh, it reminded me a little bit of David's attitude. You remember when David heard um, Goliath taunting the uh, Israelites. And David was indignant because he basically took it as, it was an attack on God, who God is. And he said, you know, who is it that taunts the armies of the living God? Um, and I see that Hezekiah comes to God similarly zealous for the reputation of God, not for the welfare of the people primarily, but for the reputation of God. And he sees the oppression of his people as an opportunity for God to vindicate his own name. He sees this situation where someone's coming to attack the Israelites. He sees it as a chance for God to show people what he's like. And, uh, and that's what he prays, is that in this circumstance, Lord, do, do something great so that people will see what you're like. And it reminded me of uh, Moses in Exodus 32 when, you remember when the people have made the golden calf and um, God says, hey, I'm just going to start over. I'm going to kill these people and start over with you, Moses. And Moses' response is something similar. He basically says, what will the Egyptians say if they hear about this? Again, Moses isn't primarily concerned with the people. He's concerned about the reputation of God. And his prayer to God is on the basis of, I want your name to be great. I don't want anybody to have a reason to think less of you. And, and so I see this with holy men and great men of God as they have a real concern for the name of the Lord and whether he's being reverenced and the circumstances around them or not. And uh, it's really, it brought to my mind the question for me of, do I see the trials in my life as opportunities for God's name to be exalted? Do I see the circumstances in my life as opportunities for God to get reverence and for people to honor him? Um, and it made me think that the name and the glory of God is what's hanging in the balance in my life and even the daily trials I go through. And so when I seek deliverance, I've just been thinking about this. Do I, why am I seeking deliverance? Why am I seeking help? What's the purpose of me coming to God? Am I mindful of how this situation reflects on the Lord like Hezekiah is, like Moses and David were? Am I, uh, about what it says about the one who I claim to be my God? Am I concerned about that at all? Do I see all of these little moments in my life as having, as having eternal implications and that they reflect on the nature and character and delivering power of God Almighty? Or am I only fixated on the here and now? Do I only want out because I'm uncomfortable or, and I'm only concerned with my name and my reputation and my comfort just in this moment? And it's just brought to my mind that more and more I want my prayers and the circumstances of my life to give me opportunities to ask God to make his name great. Not opportunities for me to ask for help as much as I need God's help, but the center of my prayer ought to be, God, make your name great. Prove yourself to be great in this situation. And that's, that's something that I want for everything in my life to prove how wonderful he is, how blessed it is to walk with him, how tender and loving he is as a father, the fullness of grace and salvation that belongs to me in Christ. And is that the scale that I'm living on when I'm going through my um, daily trials? Or... Um, am I just focused on this getting out of this situation? I think it's what part of what it means to live a God-centered life is praying God-centered prayers. And um, I see later on in Hezekiah's life, something changes. Uh, he gets sick. God does deliver him miraculously. It's a really great story if you haven't read it in 2 Kings 19. But then in 2 Kings 20, he gets sick. And God basically sends Isaiah to tell him to get his affairs in order. And I see there's an interesting thing in, in, uh, in verse 3 of chapter 20. 
Hezekiah is praying to God, and this time his prayer sounds different to me. He says, Remember, O Lord, I beseech you, how I've walked before you in truth with a whole heart, and I've done what's good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And what I see there is he's basically feeling sorry for himself. In the midst of this trial, he's feeling sorry for himself. He's pleading his own case. He's talking about his own merits. And he doesn't even consider God's reputation and his glory in his prayer this time around like he did before. He makes no mention of God's name. And um, what's interesting is God ends up answering his prayer. You see in verse 6, it says, I'll add 15 years to to your life and I'll deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I'll defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So God answers his prayer, but two terrible things happen during this time, which wouldn't have happened if Hezekiah hadn't, maybe, hadn't asked for his life to be extended. One of the terrible things is all the treasuries of Israel would be robbed by Babylon. So you see in verse 12, it says, at that time, a son of the king of Babylon sent letters to Hezekiah, and he ends up, it's, it's a longer exchange, but the point is, all of Israel's treasuries get robbed in the time when Hezekiah would have been dead if he hadn't fought for his own life on his own merits. And the other thing that happens is his son Manasseh was conceived. In chapter 21, verse 1, it says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. So his father died when he was 12, which means he was born three years after God extended his life. And Manasseh was a terrible king. In um, in verse 9, it says... um, Israel did not listen. Manasseh seduced them to do evil more than all the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. So we had this wicked king born in this period of time where God basically, you know, quote unquote, answers Hezekiah's prayer. And um, what I saw here is, and you see, by the way, that Hezekiah's focus really shifts because when he hears that God will extend his life, and and even after Isaiah warns him that the treasuries are going to be robbed, um... It says in verse 19, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, Is it not so if there will be peace and truth in my days? And um, I see there clearly he's not concerned with the name of the Lord or with the well-being of the Lord's people. He's only concerned with the time he's alive and whether his days will be comfortable. The scale he's considering in thinking about his, the circumstances of his life has shrunk from the glory of God is at stake to, Oh, I'll have peace in my days. That's nice. And I see such a contrasting true fruit of self-centered prayer, like the, the second prayer he prayed, which is, it may have looked to him at the time that God answered his prayer, right? He gets an immediate affirmative answer that, it, that hey, my life will be extended. And so he must have thought, wow, God must be happy with me. But then such unexpected evil may not have otherwise occurred if he hadn't prayed that self-centered prayer. And so I just see from this that we have to be spiritually minded and pray God-centered prayers um, and, and we judge the fruit of our prayer life and discern which answers are true blessings, not by, not by our natural eyes, but by spiritual eyes. And I can't help but wonder how Hezekiah felt. He can't, he can't have known the damage that he did to Israel um, and the damage that he did to the Lord's name because of, this, because of his son who's a wicked king. But um, one thing that I saw, I was looking at this story from another passage as well. And, and uh, the same story is recounted in Second Chronicles. And in chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles, one thing really stood out to me. It says in uh, verse 31, it's referring to when the the, uh, treasuries of the Lord get robbed. In in, uh, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 31, it says, Even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left Hezekiah alone only to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. And so I see here that God allows such circumstances into our lives to see how we will respond. And um, if you think about in the first case, when the king of Assyria came to him and he really prayed that the name of God would be honored, you know, a strong army comes against him. God's thinking, what's he going to do? How's he going to respond? And, and he's concerned about God's name. He says, great, then I'll deliver him. Um, He's concerned about my name. And then a a while later, a terrible sickness comes upon him. I think God again is looking, saying, how is he going to respond? What's he going to do? And he gets concerned about his life. Not the name of the Lord, but his life and whether he'll have peace in his days. And I think God probably thought, wow, I really hope for something better. I hoped he would have submitted himself to this. Who knows what God would have done if Hezekiah, when Isaiah came to him and said, you're going to die, if he had said, God's will be done. You know, he gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who knows what God would have done? Um, But it made me think that I can expect and we can expect the same in the trials which we face. 
Will our concern continue to be the glory of God and the goodness of his name as it's seen by the people in our lives um, and as it's seen by God and by the devil? Or is there, is there some tenderness that a trial can provoke in me? Is there some circumstance which gets at a tenderness in my heart for something other than the name of God, for something in my life, my reputation? And God's always seeking. He allows these circumstances in to see, is he concerned about my glory or at some point does he get concerned about himself? And uh, each of these tests show me and they show God whether I'm rooted in the here and now, in my physical existence, my physical comfort, or whether I'm a true Christian and I'm anchored in the spiritual realm and I'm concerned with spiritual things, namely God's name being honored, his will being done, and his kingdom coming. And I pray that more and more I would be praying for, for God's glory to be honored, that I would have no concern for my own name, but that I would pray for God's name to be honored and God's glory to be seen in every circumstance in my life.